People said, Amen. Take your Bibles and turn them to the book of Philippians, would you? The book of Philippians. And uh, this is a sweet, sweet spirit in the house of the Lord today. And, you know, that's what uh, praise does. That's what worship does. It's, uh, it opens the door for us to be aware of God in heaven is in our midst. Amen. And if the opposite of rejoicing, because the theme of, the theme of Philippians is rejoice, 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 rejoice. And the more I've looked into this church uh, in Philippi, the more I've seen that what was the reason that Paul had to over and over again accentuate the fact that we as believers are supposed to rejoice in the Lord. And as you go through and you start seeing some of the themes that are brought out fairly strongly in this book, there's one that deals with, well, a disunity. There's a, a friction and a tension that's going on. And the other theme that goes through the book, and I believe this is the reason that Paul accentuated so heavily this rejoicing theme, is one of complaining, one of complaining. And if we're not very, very careful, complaining can take us away from rejoicing. We can see all the negative, and we never see any positive. And so this morning, just the title of just a quick, quick thought message here is The Power of Positivity. Now, I know people have taken that and run in the wrong direction with it, but there is something powerful about positivity. But positivity, we if we're not careful, we all struggle with. There was a man that... Um decided to join a monastery. And this man was given the set of rules that he could only say two words every 10 years. Two words every 10 years. And so the first 10 years passed, and on his 10-year anniversary, he came before the friar, and uh, he said, what are your two words? And he says, bad food, and walked out. Well, another 10 years passed, and this same monk came in before the friar, and he's like, okay, what, what are your two words? And the man looked at him, the man, the monk, his 20-year anniversary, and he says, hard bed, and he walked back out. On the 30th anniversary, this brother comes in before the friar, 30 years have passed, he has two words, and he looks at him and he says, I quit. And the friar looked at him and says, well, I don't see why you wouldn't. All you've done since you've been here is complain. Are you, did y'all follow that? And so complaining. I love the quote of Mark Twain. It hurts, but it's got some power to it. He says, don't complain and don't talk about all your problems. He says, 80% of the people don't care. And 20% think that you probably deserve it. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, that sort of stung, didn't it? Amen. I thought it was powerful. So now you understand. Watch this. We, we see it all around. We see the propensity in our own lives, if we're honest. We see a propensity towards that complaining. And that's why Paul, look with me in Philippians chapter 2, as we're going verse by verse through the book of Philippians. He's told us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. He's like, it's God that works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so God wants to work out what he's worked in. We don't work for our salvation. We work out. It's like, mining a mine or, 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 or working a field and bringing the crops up. God has placed beautiful things within our life and we are to work those things out into a reality of where people can see those attributes through our life. And so we look and we say, he's like, okay, I want you to work out your salvation and I want them to be able to see the evidences of Jesus Christ in your life. And, then, and, and watch this, I want you to look at me just a second. Can y'all understand me okay? Amen or no? Okay. <clears throat> What he's saying is this. He says, I want you to work out Jesus Christ in your life so that people can see Jesus Christ. And what is amazing to me, after he talks about, for it is God that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, it is absolutely astounding to me of what comes next. Of all the verses and of all the words and of all the admonitions that Paul could give, I, I for one, just in my personal self as a man, as a Christian, I'm amazed at what comes next. It just almost, in my mind, if I was going to write out the Bible, I, I don't know if this would be the next thing that I would write down. Because I didn't maybe grasp the importance of what's coming next. He says, I want people to be able to see Jesus Christ through your life. I want them to be able to see the evidences of the working of God through your life. And the biggest thing that is going to throw water on that and to hide that and to hinder that is what Paul is about to cover for our lives. Watch what he says. Do all things without murmuring. And disputings. What does he say? That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, 
in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And so Paul is saying, if they're going to be able to see Christ in your life, if you're going to work out your salvation, one of the evidences of that is going to be your attitude. Because your attitude is going to directly affect your actions, and your actions are going to directly affect your, your witness and your faith. And the biggest thing for all of our lives is that there's a train behind us of people that we are taking to heaven with us through our witness, through what we do for the Lord Jesus Christ, through missions, that we've got a train load, one hooked upon another, of people that are going to be going to heaven because of our lives. And he says, folks, you got to be real, real careful because it's going to be awfully hard to win somebody when all you're doing is complaining about things because it's going to ruin your witness. And Paul is going to be dealing with that. See, an optimist. What is an optimist see? You know the glass that's, that's uh, half full? What is the optimist see when, when the glass has got halfway full of water? The optimist sees a glass that is half full. I gave you the answer, folks. The optimist sees the a glass that is half the pessimist sees the glass that is half the complainer. The complainer sees the glass that's slightly chipped, holding water that isn't cold enough. Probably because it's taken from the tap when I wanted bottled water. And wait, there's a smudge on the glass, which means it hasn't been cleaned properly, which means that I'm going to come down with COVID, and I'm probably going to end up in the hospital. And now I don't know what in the world is going to happen to my life. Why does this stuff always happen to me? And that is the uh, mindset of a chronic complainer. It's not a matter that the glass is half full or the glass is half empty. We're going to dissect the glass and tell everybody what's wrong with the blooming glass. Amen. Are you all with me? Amen. And so why, why do I murmur? The word murmur there, you can just write down the word complain. Why, why, why is Tony Howarth given to complaining? Uh, why, why, am, why am I given to complaining? Uh, do things not go the way they, I, think, I think they should? Do things not go the way that I think they should? And if they don't go the way that I think they should, well, maybe the people need to hear my opinion about that. Maybe that's where my, my arguing comes in. And uh, my murmuring, my, my grumblings, my gripings, my complainings. And so things don't go the way that I think they should. Uh, do I feel like that I deserve better than what's happening? I mean, would you look at what's happening in my life? Would you look at what's happening to me? I mean, don't I, don't I deserve better than this? I mean, I've served the Lord, and I've honored God, and I've done this, and I've done this. I mean, do I really deserve what's happening to me? And so maybe I murmur and complain because of that. Maybe I, I just, as Tony Howarth, I struggle with two things. I struggle with contentment. And I struggle with gratitude. And maybe with me struggling with contentment and gratitude, maybe that brings complaining in my life. And then arguing. Arguing. Uh, do I view things? Is my view of things the right one? And, um, you know, it's like somebody said, you know, people don't mind you having a different opinion as long as yours is theirs. It's getting to be more and more obvious. Everybody has the right answer. Just ask them. It doesn't matter what it deals with. They, they've got the right answer. If somebody disagrees with me, the reason I argue is that uh, I, I think that I've got the right opinion, and I, I think that you're right, and, and I'm going to use a word. I'm not pointing at you, but this is our mindset. I, I have the right opinion, and I really think you're rather stupid if you don't have the right opinion or if you want to go against what I'm saying. It is just really showing your ignorance because I've got the right opinion. And then if you disagree with me, the reason I'm going to argue and be contentious with you is that I take it as a personal attack that you don't, you don't see things the way that I see things. And I'm going to argue with you, and I'm going to raise my voice, and I'm going to accentuate it, I'm going to just keep on dogging this thing, because my voice is so important, it's got to be heard. That's the reason I'll talk over you. I'll talk through you. I'll argue with you. I'll try to intimidate you, because my voice has got to be heard. Do all things without murmurings. And disputings, Paul said. He said that ye may be blameless and harmless as sons of God. He's dealing with our witness and the Word of God and some different things. And he's showing you and I how important it is that our attitude is one of not complaining. Because again, we are to work out what God's worked in. And watch this. Ready for this? Isn't it amazing that some Christians, they get the right Bible? Maybe they get the right church? Maybe they get the right Bible with the right seat in the right church, with the right preacher, with the right temperature? Now, that's not a Baptist church because we never can get the temperature right. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. All right. So what, what I'm saying is this. So we, we, I got this right, and I got this right, and I got this right, and I got this right. Have you ever seen somebody that ha seemingly had all the boxes checked off, and they were a nightmare to be around? Why? Because just give them five seconds, and they'll find something to complain about. 
the weather's too hot, the weather's too cold, the weather's too rainy, the weather's too dry, the, the clouds are too low, the clouds are too hot. Well, it doesn't matter what it is. And so we find a reason to complain. There's a lady that wrote many, many hymns, and you're very familiar with her. Her name is Fanny Crosby. And you know that because of a treatment uh, on her eyes, it left her blind. I am absolutely floored of the spirituality and depth uh, that this young lady grasped. I'm about to read to you a poem of hers when she uh, wrote it when she was nine. Now watch this. She was nine years old when she wrote this poem. Oh, what a happy soul am I, although I cannot see. I am resolved that in this world contented will I be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and cry because I'm blind. I cannot, nor I won't. Nine years old, this young lady had a grasp of her relationship with God that at 51, I wonder if I'm even close to. And she says, I, I refuse to complain regardless of the situations I'm in. Are we going around as victims or as victors? Do we go around as worshipers or as whiners? Are we perceived as kind and considerate? Are we just absolutely cantankerous? Are we evangelicals? I'm an evangelical Christian. Why are we depicted as always being so angry? How come we're always lifting up that which we are against rather than anything that we are for? Do people understand as we look at this season, do they understand my political views, but they don't have a clue about my personal faith? Do others refer to me as a sour saint? Or does a smile of kindness cross their lips when they think of my name? Complaining as we look within our life, murmuring and grumblings as we go through Scripture and see principles of complaining. Complaining will always focus on the faults of others. Look with me, if you will. And I wish I had these notes for you because this is some really powerful stuff this morning. In James 5, 9, he says, Grudge not one against another, brethren. And that's what's amazing about this. It's not a matter that we are going against the lost. Notice that word right there with me, would you? Grudge not, and say the word with me when I come to it and point to it. Ready? Grudge not one against another. Next word. It's not talking about the battle against the lost. It's not talking about demons and angels. It's not talking about uh, righteousness and evil. It's talking about brethren. Th those that are, are, are born-again believers, it says, Grudge not. One against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Can you imagine fighting and griping with your brothers or sister? And uh, how many of this ever happened to you guys? Um, my mom and dad, uh, before I knew who the Holy Spirit was, I knew about the Holy Spirit. Uh, my mom and dad could just show up. There they were. I don't know where they came from, but man, they could just uh, uh, materialize. And boy, we were in trouble. And you ever been complaining? Complaining to your sister or brother, your mom and dad were so mean, your mom and dad are this, your mom and dad are that, and how could your mom or dad or do this kind of stuff? And you turn around, look in the door, and guess who's standing in the doorway? Do you see the, do you see the verse? He says, grudge not one against another. You ever been fighting and going at it with your brothers or sisters? <laughs> and, and you look up, and there's your mom and dad just standing there watching y'all, wait, just, just waiting for the right opportunity to, to give you some holy adjustment, amen? He says, grudge not one against another. And if we're not careful... My soul, we complain. We complain against one another. We find that complaining in 1 Peter 4 and 9, it just steals my servant's spirit. It kills my servant's heart. He says, use hospitality one to another without grudging, without all this complaining and contention. He says, this shouldn't be within your life, Tony. I need to realize my complaining, who is my complaining ultimately against? I can target you. I can target COVID. I can target circumstances. I can target the country. I can target so, so many things. But beloved, who is my complaining really against? Is it not the God of heaven? Adam, you got to love Adam. Adam in Genesis 3.12. <laughs> Eve is taking the fruit, gave to Adam. They've sinned against God. If y'all with me, say amen. Okay, now watch this. And Adam gets called on it, right? Don't you love this? I mean, it's, it's just a brazenness of, of our human nature. And the man said, who is the man talking to? Who is Adam speaking with? Talk to me. One, two, three. Okay, watch this. And the man said, not to add to the Bible, but in reading here. And the man said to God, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Adam is looking at God. Adam has failed. And Adam's looking at God. And Adam's saying, 
hey, it's not my fault. You're the one that gave her to her. me. If you never gave her to me, I would never would have done this. And why, who, whom thou gavest me? I just want to remind you, God, I didn't ask for. I mean, I went to sleep one night and I woke up and bam, there she was. I had no... I, are you with me, man? And so isn't it amazing that we, we really are complaints against God, whom thou gavest me. And we may not do it in the verbiage of God, 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 using his name. But I wonder if our complaining is not just really against God. And that's the reason God takes it so personally. Complaining is saying God's not fair. In Genesis 4, 13 and 14, Cain kills Abel. Now, notice that you, know, you see the absurdities of these things in the Bible. Maybe I missed them in Tony's life. Cain complains after killing Abel. Watch what he says, Genesis 4, 13 and 14. And Cain said unto the Lord, now, now watch this. This just blows my mind. <laughs> and Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Now, you just killed somebody in cold blood. It was first degree premeditated murder. But it's not fair the way, God, you're treating me because this is greater than I can bear. Look at verse 14 with me, Genesis 4. Behold, thou hast driven... Now watch this. Behold, thou hast driven me out of this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. That's funny to me because he wasn't seeking God's face in the first place, but now he's upset that God has hid his face from him. <laughs> and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive. And a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. Isn't it amazing that he is so upset that somebody is liable to do to him what he just did to his very own brother? Isn't it amazing my complaining is against God, and it's always about something that's not fair. My dad taught me, and boy, I hated it. Good gravy of mercy, I hated it. The older I've gotten, the more I've appreciated it. But when you're a young teenager or even older teenager, something would happen. And boy, I had a complaining spirit. I did. I, Miss Maggie, I, I wish I could tell you that pastor's always been perfect. But that's just come about in the last five years. Um, I'm just making sure you all listening. Amen. <laughs> Excuse me. And so my, I would do something. I'd, I'd have a complaining spirit about something. And, and my phrase, I don't know where I picked it up, Brother Harry Mask, uh, but I picked it up. I picked it up. And once I picked it up, it's like I wanted to use it all the time. And my, my phrase was this, Miss Ann, that's not fair. That's not fair. That's not fair. And my dad started coming back when I would say that's not fair, and maybe yours did as well. And he would look at me and say, well, son, life's not fair. Isn't it amazing that it's okay for other people to go through certain things that we pray about and we don't really think twice about it, but if it ever happens to us, then all of a sudden life's not, it's not fair. It's okay that everybody else goes through the same exact thing, but when Tony's got to go through it, then all of a sudden that's not fair. Fair. And so a complaining spirit comes up within my life. Complaining comes and I need to hurry. Complaining comes when I forget what God's done for me. You know, Israel's been led out of Egypt. They've pilfered Egypt. They've gone out. They, they, they were there as poor. They left as mighty and rich. All right? They have pilfered these people. They, the, the, I say pilfered. The Egyptians wanted them out of there so bad. They gave them anything they asked for. They wanted them out of there. And so they get taken over the Red Sea. They walk out on dry ground. They are delivered from the chariots of Egypt. They are delivered from the bondage and all that. Do you know in less than three days from all that God has done, do you know that they're murmuring, griping, and complaining against God because of water? And I look within my life, and it's real easy for me to get onto Israel and just preach the house down against Israel. And then I'm looking at my life going, if I'm not careful, if I'm not careful... Uh, something small, really, really seemingly insignificant, has a way of stealing my joy. All right, now watch this. I know that you're godly, and uh, you, this wouldn't happen to you. Uh, we, the, the glory of God could come down. The Holy Spirit could manifest Himself. God could look at you on the screen, speak deeply into your heart and life, sit down right next to you. The glory of God falls. We could shout and sing and hallelujah. Are y'all with me? Uh, are you with me? And, and all of a sudden, we go out to get in our car, and the car won't start. Isn't it amazing how just the smallest of things, and I'm going to go out today and try to go home, and my tire is going to be flat. So praise Jesus. Amen, right? And so all of a sudden, it's the smallest of things. 
can steal away our joy. Now watch this. Are you seeing, I would encourage you to read through the book of Philippians with a mindset of why did Paul have to over and over again tell them to rejoice? Why did Paul have to over and over again tell them and accentuate rejoicing to this church? They were having trouble getting along with each other because I believe a complaining spirit had had come into the church and whenever complaining comes into a church, whenever complaining comes into a family, contention always follows that. And so all of a sudden, God's not fair. I forget what God's done. Truthfully, I have a lack of faith in God. I can sing in here, I believe, I can believe. How many of y'all had, have, have had shouting days, glorious days, hallelujah days, praising God days, and then you went to the mailbox, and it just killed that day? And all of a sudden, you're sitting there going, why in the world do I got insurance? You, what? What do you mean this doctor's not under this program? What do you mean this medication's not, 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 not covered under this plan? Wait, wait a minute. You mean for me to have a medicine that I need to survive on that it's going to cost me how many thousands of dollars per month? Wait a minute. Don't you know that I'm on a fixed income? Have you ever just wanted to write a letter going, you got to be kidding me and send it back? Where's my faith at? And so through medical bills, through issues that come into my life, my children, my grandchildren, our church, our family, circumstances within our nation. All of a sudden, I look and I'm like, do I really have faith in God? And all of a sudden, if something happens through the election, or if something happens through sickness, or if something, just pick wherever you want to pick in this spectrum that we're going through right now. If something happens, I've got to remind myself of this. It doesn't matter what happens next week. It doesn't matter what happens next month. It doesn't matter what happens next year. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do on a daily basis as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ because I am not the one in charge of this thing. I'm not the one giving the orders in this thing. I'm not the one dictating what's going to happen in this thing. I'm going to occupy until He comes. I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to walk with the God of heaven. I'm going to study His Word. I'm going to meditate upon His Scriptures. I'm going to love Him. And if by chance, through whatever He he wants to do, he takes my life, then rejoice at my service because I have finally made it home. God is always in control. Amen or no? And so my complaining, can you believe that? Can you believe? Can you believe? Can you? My complaining shows Tony. My complaining, Tony's complaining, <laughs> shows my, my lack of faith in God. It's a sin. It's just a sin against God. As you go through 1 Corinthians, my time's gone. As you go, <coughs> as you go through 1 Corinthians, <coughs> it's a sin against God. God sent the destroying angel to Israel because they were complaining, complaining, complaining. Do you know complaining is contagious? Everybody's worried about wearing masks. Now take this in con- Are y'all with me? Amen. <coughs> I'm looking forward to everybody getting rid of masks so I can see your face. Maybe. <laughs> But all of a sudden, we, we look at this thing, and uh, well, COVID, you're going to get COVID, so we wear a mask. You're going to get COVID, so we wear a mask. And you got some people want to wear a mask. You got some people think masks are crazy. But I pick, take your pick. But we wear a mask because we don't want people to get COVID. And so we don't want get people to get COVID, so we wear a mask. Ready for this? I wonder if we need to start wearing duct tape. Do you follow that? Because maybe you keep the complaining down. Because complaining is contagious. You say, preacher, well, what do you know about this? Okay, can, can I tell you something about leadership for a second? And uh, let's remove ourselves from church if I was in the business world or anything. Um, you realize they, pastor, they said this, pastor, they did this, pastor, they, you know, they is between two and five people. They's not everybody at all, never is, never will be. But it is amazing how it can start, and I'm just going to point to the left, and it's not because, well, maybe because of Hubert there, but... Point to the left. Let's just say over in the left-hand corner where nobody's sitting, okay? Uh, they're going to start over there. And then they meet somebody back there. And then two or three more get over there. All of a sudden, man, if you're not careful in leadership, in your life group class, in your family, they, man, they can, they can absolutely germinate. And it becomes contagious. And all of a sudden, people were looking at things as positive. And now things are looked at as negative. And people were excited. And now they're like, I'm losing energy. Because not only is this whole complaining thing contagious, it's counterproductive. See, in the church of Philippi, it should have had great energies in serving God. But when Paul gets there, <laughs> Paul's writing there, excuse me. When Paul writes there, 
They are commanded to rejoice because they're complaining. They're, they're commanded to be unified and to go forward in one spirit because the complaining has brought contention, what brought division, which is bringing ineffectiveness. And that's the reason Paul said, men, could y'all go back with me right quick, curveball. Would you go back to our text, Philippians? Would you go back to Philippians with me? And uh, watch this. <coughs> Do all things without murmurings and disputings. You're working out your salvation. You're working out what Christ has done in you. You're working that out for everybody to be able to see. Because Church of Philippi, you're to be an example and a witness. And you're supposed to be bringing a train, train load of people with you into heaven. He says, don't be complaining and don't be arguing. Stop fighting. Stop fighting. Stop complaining. Stop being contentious. There's souls that are at stake. Watch what he says right here. He says, do all things uh, without murmuring and disputing. <laughs> Verse 15, please. That. He says, the reason is this, <coughs> that ye may be blameless and harmless. He's like that your testimony would be pure. See, one of the things, the power of positivity is in our witness. And there's some people that when you get around them, you just love, you just love being around them, amen? You just love being around them. They give, they give, they're energy givers, and they give you energy. <laughs> and some people are energy takers, and they suck the life out of you, amen? And uh, you're like, well, how can I know if I'm an energy giver or an energy taker? <laughs> Ask yourself, how do you respond to this question? How are you doing? And if you're one that's got to take the next 10 minutes to tell everybody about every wrong thing in your life, then you're sucking the life out of them. You say, preacher, I'm just telling you. If you look in your life and you've got fewer and fewer people that are asking you, how are you doing? It's because they've learned. Is anybody with me? <laughs> if you're one that they ask you, hey, how you doing? How you doing? And it's like, hey, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's what Paul's saying in this whole, <coughs> I'm so sorry, folks. This whole, this whole book, as I've looked through it and I've read through it several times, it's a whole book over and over this week. I'm like, my soul, I don't know how I've missed this. I'm, and I, I knew semblances of it, but he's saying, I want you to rejoice and rejoice and rejoice and rejoice and rejoice and rejoice as you go through this thing. I've got so many notes even in my Bible. As you go through this, I want you to rejoice and rejoice and rejoice and rejoice because the other side of that is I want you to rejoice because you're complaining, because you're now contentious, because now your effectiveness is diminishing, your, your testimony for Christ. I want you to be positive. I know things aren't always easy, but you know, there's a guy named Epaphroditus that almost died serving the Lord for you, for me. I mean, he's like, this guy is just unbelievable, and we're going to get to him in a couple weeks, but he's like, I want you to be positive. I want you to be positive. Who can you infuse energy into today? Who could you encourage today? I know we've got this to deal with, and we've got this to deal with, and this to deal with, and I realize that we wake up with it, and I realize that we go to bed with it, and I realize that we are inundated with it and I realize that sometimes we feel like maybe it's just me but this year it's almost like somebody has taken a pillow and put it over our face and said now I want you to breathe ha yeah and we find a complaining spirit. We find us finding fault with things. We find us being argumentative and contentious. We find ourselves being argumentative and against. We find ourselves having to get our voice heard and known. We find ourselves getting defensive and offended. Oh, my soul. Paul's like, don't you understand? Do all things without complaining, without murmuring, without arguing, without disputing. Why? That you might have a right testimony as sons of God that's without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Crooked. It's one of the, 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 the word there is where we get all word for scoliosis. The curvature of the spine. It's not right. It's pushing things out of line. It's not straight. It's not the way it should be. He's like, I want you to be positive for your witness sake. I want you to be a light to the world in the midst of all of this darkness. I want you to shine with the positivity of your faith and rejoicing in Jesus Christ. I want you to be positive for your witness sake. And then I want you to be positive for the world's sake. The world has enough negative. Give them something to shout about. Uh, give them something to shout about. And in order for you to give them something to shout about, you got to get your shout back. And I know that's probably old school terminology. But you got to get your shout back. 
I'm not talking about, you know, uh, made up stuff in the worship service and all, but you got to get your shout back. You got to get your amen back. You got to get your glory to God back. You got to get your smile back. You got to get your hope back. You got to get your twinkle in your eye back. You got to get that Holy Ghost moving in your heart and soul where there's liberty and freedom because I'm telling you this if you want to shut down the Holy Ghost of God in your spirit and in the services, be a complainer, be a whiner, be a grumbler, be a griper. Everything's negative, everything's wrong. You can write down everything that should be that, that should be fixed with the glass. Some are going to see it half full, some are going to see it half empty, and some are going to be just a chronic complainer that can give you ten things about that glass that is wrong with it. Stop finding everything that's wrong with your husband. Stop finding everything wrong with your wife. Stop finding everything wrong with the kids. Stop finding everything wrong with the country. Stop finding everything wrong with this COVID. Stop finding everything wrong in the services. Stop finding everything wrong in your life and start finding something right for the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get your shout on. Get around somebody that's sad and put some happiness in their life. That's what Paul's talking about. Amen. God bless you. I try to stay, but I just got to, it's just eating me up. It, it, for, it, be positive for your witness. Be positive for the world. And then watch this. Be positive for the Word. For the Word. He says, uh, holding forth the Word of life. Holding forth the Word of life. And we have the joy <laughs> and the privilege of holding forth the Word of God. My soul. We get to hold the Word of God. We hold fast. You hold fast that Bible. Don't let go of that Bible. Don't let go of that Bible. Don't let go of that Bible. Don't, go, don't let go of that Bible. Don't let that Bible leave your heart. Don't let the Bible leave your mind. Don't let the Bible leave your soul. Don't let the Bible leave your home. Don't let the Bible leave your workplace. Don't let the Word of God leave you. Hold fast to the Bible. And then hold it forth. Tell somebody about the Word of God. Uh, share the Word of God on your timelines. Share the Word of God on your tweet and your Instagram and your Twitter and your Snap this and whatever you got. Glory to God. Find some app and share Jesus Christ on it. Amen. Put the Word of God out there. Put the Word of God out. Flood the Word of God uh, with everything. Put the Word of God. Have faith in that Bible. Have faith in the Word of God. This, this Word right here is quick. It's alive. And it's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. Able to divide in the son of the soul and spirit, the joint and the marrow of the bone. It has a way of delving deep into the hearts and lives of each and every person. Man, beloved, for the Word of God's sake, be positive. Stop complaining. Love Jesus. Let them see your faith in God. Faith in God's Word. Faith in what God's doing. Let them see. Paul's like, oh, church, you have so much potential. And it's amazing. A church with so much potential that he's got to tell them over and over, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. I know it's not always easy. Rejoice. I know you have enemies. Rejoice. I know it's not fun. Rejoice. I know you got people that uh, you think that you ought to be in their position in the church and you should be getting the notoriety and you should be getting the recognition. He said, I want you to rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. And what he's saying with this, I want you to rejoice because I want you to stop complaining. I want you to stop being contentious. I want you to start being a witness. Oh, that people would be saved. Can somebody say amen? You want to change a church? Week after week, service after service, day after day, let somebody get saved, let them get saved, let them get saved, let them get saved, let them get saved. saved. It'll change a home, a heart, a church, a place, a preacher, a teacher, a man, a woman. It'll change them, amen. See them get saved this morning. (laughs) Sorry, after 11 o'clock service. (coughs) Could be a young man going to be getting baptized. And praise God, he's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And wants to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. He says, I want you to be positive. I want you to be positive for for, for your witness. Uh, For the world, for the word. And he says, for the workers. He's like, "Ah, I want you to be positive. I want you to stop complaining. He says, because I want to rejoice. I want to rejoice in the day of Christ that I've not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And it's not just for preachers. Man, preachers would take that and say, oh, y'all need to start complaining because uh, you're going to really limit the preacher, limit the preacher. And th- that is definitely there. But oh, what about your life group leaders? What about your deacons? What about your husbands? What about your moms, your dads? Your bosses, employers, think about those in leadership. Think about those that have some type of leadership in your life. Oh, dear me, if you want to burn them out, just complain. If you want to burn out your mom and dad, just complain. If you want to burn out your husband, just complain. You want to burn out your wife, just complain. You want to burn out your deacon, just complain. You want to burn them out, just complain. All you got to do to burn them out is just complain. Incessantly, over and over and over and over. Complain, complain, complain. Just keep on doing it. 
And you will burn out people that love you and want to help you. That's what Paul's dealing with right there. Are y'all with me, amen or no? Y'all got two more minutes? Tony Campolo. Don't know about him. I'm not endorsing him. Not going against him. I don't know nothing about him. But in my reading and all, I came across this of a story that he told, excuse me, beloved, of two men who were traveling together on a train out of Victoria Station in London. Twenty minutes into their journey, one of the men had an epileptic seizure as if uh, this thing had been happening before. Uh, if you've seen this happen before, if you've been around somebody with an epileptic seizure, you know that it can be rather frightening as this man fell uh, to the floor there out of his seat. The man stiffened. He fell heavily uh, on the floor. And when this happened, his friend that was beside him immediately took off his own jacket and he rolled it up. And he put it behind the stricken man's head. And then he blotted the head of perspiration from the brow of his friend with his handkerchief. And he talked with him in just a very quiet manner to keep him calm. A few minutes later, the seizure was over. He then helped his friend up, lifted him up, and gently put him back into the seat. He turned to the man sitting across from them and said, Mister, p- please forgive us. Uh, sometimes this happens two or three times a day to my friend. And then in the conversation that ensued, the friend of the epileptic man explained this. You see, my buddy and I here, we were in Vietnam together. And we were both wounded in the same battle. I had bullets in both my legs, and he caught one in his shoulder. For some reason, the helicopter that was to pick us up never came to pick us up. My friend here picked me up and carried me for three days out of the jungle. The Viet Cong were sniping at us the whole way. Understanding now, he that is carrying me is in more agony than I was. Repeatedly, I begged him to drop me and save himself, but he would not let me go. He got me out of that jungle, mister. He saved my life. I don't know how he did it. I don't know why he did it. But he did. Well, four years ago, I found out that he had this epileptic condition. So I sold my house in New York. I took the money I had and came over here to take care of him. And then he looked at his friend and he said this. You see, mister, after what he did for me, there isn't anything I wouldn't do for him. And I wonder sometimes when Tony wants to start his complaining if I've just forgotten what Jesus Christ has done for me. And he's done a whole lot more than carry me three days through a jungle, though that is incredibly admirable. Do you remember what Jesus Christ has done for you? And maybe today, you're going to have opportunity, I'm going to have opportunity to complain. But maybe by the help of God, we would take something negative and we make it positive. Because I'm telling you, Paul understood it. He wanted Philippi to understand it. And he wants Tony Howard to understand it today. That there's power in positivity. Lift up Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen? Father, we love you so very much. We're grateful. We realize by way of live stream and those listening there that they don't have to do that and the ones sitting here in person don't have to be here. And God, we're just, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful. And I pray, Father, for an attitude of gratitude and a spirit of gratefulness. And I pray, Father, that you would turn all of our spirits to what you have done. And I pray, Father, that we would just have praise within our life. Uh, Father, it's not going to be easy. Things are going to come up today, no doubt, no doubt. They're going to come up today. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to remember this message and remember what Paul was trying to teach them, that we were to do all things. It didn't matter what it was, all things, without murmuring and disputings. I pray, Father, that that would just blazon itself within my heart and within my life. I am deeply in love with these people. I'm in, just indebted to them. I'm just grateful for them. And God, I want you, I want you to use them. Uh, I want you to use them in a mighty way. I want, to, I want you to use them, Lord, to, to, to reach the lost here, uh, to disciple and to mentor and to train up and to build people that are strong in the Word of God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, for them to minister to others, uh, they need you to minister to them. 
And so, Father, I don't know what the need is right now, but I want to just take a moment and ask Holy Spirit that you would move and work in hearts and lives and that you would fill the gaps uh, that are empty this morning and that you would give grace and strength, that you would give healing. Uh, Father, we have so many that are sick. We pray, Father, that you give healing to their bodies. We pray, Father, you give hope to their lives. We pray for a divine awareness of your presence, knowing that our God does not leave us and our God does not forsake us. Lord, help us to leave with a shout. And may that shout within our soul have an eternal impact on those that do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Bless God. Bless each and every one. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.